Hi, I'm Mark Gaylor, a Sony Global Imaging Ambassador. This movie tutorial is intended for alpha photographers who may be new to their camera or find themselves shooting in auto mode most of the time. Now, maybe you're wanting to move beyond the basics, move out of auto so that you can be a little bit more creative with your interchangeable lens camera. Okay, so let's find out how we can proceed. Okay, so if you want to catch up with me after this movie tutorial, you can find me on markgaylor.com. Now, all of the learning resources on this website are absolutely free. Um, you'll be able to download um, e-learning resources such as ebooks, movies, and also uh, Lightroom presets and Photoshop actions. Okay, so uh, let's quote um, uh, one of the most famous photographers, Ansel Adams. He said that the single most important component of the camera was the 12 inches behind it. Okay, a camera doesn't take great images. Okay, but a good camera can help and Sony Alpha makes some very good cameras. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the ways the cameras can actually help us. Now, some of the auto features can make life a little bit easier. Looking at this historical photograph, we can see how difficult photography would have been back. Um, this is uh, 12 guys just shifting the focus on one of these lenses more than 100 years ago. Now, creative photography has always required um, cameras that are a little bit more sophisticated, more than just a single point shoot uh, with a single button. Now even coming back to uh, these cameras, uh, this is 1941 and you can see already there's quite a lot of adjustments or creative controls that will allow us to take great images where we can be in control of the outcome, not the camera. Now I'm going to put down a little bit of jargon, but not too much. This will make you um, more knowledgeable about the camera that you have and will, will enable you to shop more intelligently for maybe some extra um, lenses or features that you want for your camera. Now, um, one of the things that they say, um, a common saying is, does size matter? Well, in one very important factor of your camera, size really does matter. And it's not to do with the size of the camera, it's to do with the size of the sensor. The reason we're not using uh, mobile phones for great quality images is because the size of the sensors in those mobile phones is very, very small. Take a look at this uh, diagram to show you how much bigger um, an APS-C sensor is. An APS-C sensor is typically found in the Sony Alpha A6000, 6300, 6500. These cameras are often referred to as having a crop sensor. And then there are of course the uh, Alpha full frame cameras such as the A7R the A7S uh, and the A9 cameras. Now let's take a, a look at um, a little bit more jargon. Uh, one of the things you need to know about your Sony Alpha camera is that it has a mount system for the lenses. Now Sony make two different mount systems. They have the A mount system uh, and this is for cameras that have the mirrors. Uh, now if you're uh, uh, un, uh, unaware of what sort of mount system you have, if you just take off the lens off your camera and if you see a mirror then you have an A mount camera. If, however, you take off the lens of your camera and you see no mirror, you see directly the sensor behind uh, that lens, then you have an E-mount camera. Now, when you are shopping for a new lens, uh, the uh, the shop will probably ask you not only the model name, but whether it's an A-mount or E-mount camera that you own. And this will also be indicated on the box of the lens that you're purchasing. Okay, now one of the most important um, settings that we have on the camera is on the top of the camera, on the top right hand side, we have the mode dial, sometimes referred to as the shoot mode dial. Now typically when you take your camera out of the box for the first time, it'll be in auto mode. Some cameras have eye auto um, and um, this is great for set and forget shooting and typically when I hand my camera to somebody who is unfamiliar with these interchangeable lens cameras, I will quickly switch it from my shoot mode to auto before I hand it over. This gives um, the most likely uh, scenario that uh, I'm going to get a half decent image when somebody points the camera perhaps at me. So there are however some other letters on that shoot mode dial. They're often referred to as the P, A, S and M settings. Now these are for people who want a little bit more creative control over the final outcome of their camera. Now um, 
they may be a little bit scary for newcomers, but um, hopefully this tutorial will show you that we can go into some of these shoot mode dials for a specific reason. Okay, so um, one of the things that you probably um, should be aware of, you don't need to fully understand this, but um, you'll see on a lot of forums, they refer to something called the exposure triangle. There are three major factors that control how bright or dark the image is. And um, in auto mode, all of these uh, three factors are controlled automatically for you. When we come out of auto mode, um, such as into aperture priority or shutter priority, we only have to um, choose one setting in that um, uh, semi-auto mode, and the camera will choose the other two settings to always ensure that we get an appropriately exposed image, i.e. an image that's not too dark or not too light. So these are not as scary as they first appear. All you need to know is why am I going into aperture priority and what aperture do I want to select? So I would say that it's perhaps no more confusing than selecting the appropriate gear in a manual change car. Um, quite quickly after you've used the camera, maybe for a few weeks and you're starting to use those alternative shoot mode settings, then you're going to be very comfortable is why am I in uh, this um, shoot mode, such as aperture priority or shutter priority. It's a bit like uh, knowing that an appropriate gear to take off from the lights is perhaps first gear. Okay, so Let's take a, a look at um, something else that might appear on your shoot mode dial, and that is um, something called the scene settings. Now, if you are going to leave auto mode, the first one that I would actually encourage you to explore are the scene modes. These are automated settings again, but they're recipes for success. If you know what you're shooting, you can tell the camera, I'm shooting portraits. And so the camera will choose the most appropriate settings for portrait shooting. Okay, now it's adding some, um, um, basically it's using the camera's artificial intelligence, but if we use a little bit of our intelligence as well, we can start to further refine how the camera takes pictures for us. Uh, scene uses a recipe of the three exposure modes, um, or factors, uh, part of that exposure triangle. But it also takes into account such, such things as the drive mode, the focus mode, whether we're basically um, uh, shooting something that is still or something that is moving, the focus area, uh, basically um, what, um, how well we're going to tell the camera where the subject is inside of the viewfinder, and also the metering mode. The metering mode defines uh, how we uh, best uh, meter for the scene to give the most appropriate exposure. Now these recipes of settings are not really such a bad idea, but they do make certain assumptions. And uh, remember there's a famous quote by Oscar Wilde, he had to say on the uh, subject of assumption, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. Okay, so uh, although these recipes of settings um, do a, a fine job, we can further intervene uh, to refine how that image appears. Now the, fir the big four scene modes, there are more than the four, but the, the big four scene modes for me are things such as portrait, action, macro and landscapes. And so in this tutorial I'm just going to concentrate on those four areas, but you'll find other scene modes as well. Now, in these scene modes, um, three settings, three of the camera settings that the camera always chooses are a constant. And these um, um, settings are actually very reliable in getting good images, which is just as well really, because when we're in the scene modes, we can't actually alter these three specific camera settings. So I'm just gonna show you what those are. First off is the metering mode. Um, the, the probably the most reliable way of getting an accurate exposure, something that's not too dark or not too light, is using a metering mode called multi. Now when some people are learning photography, they're often advised by other amateur photographers to choose something like a, a spot metering mode. Now in the right hands, these can be reliable, but for most people, they give very unreliable results. And so I would um, probably advise you to stick with the multi metering mode, even when you're coming out of the auto mode.
Another um, one of the auto settings is something called auto ISO. This is how hard the sensor should work in uh, when either the lighting is very bright or when there is very little ambient light, the ambient light is low. And so basically the sensor will automatically work a little bit harder in low light conditions to give you an appropriate exposure. And I would uh, again encourage you to very rarely leave auto ISO even when you do leave the auto and scene modes. Okay so um, another the third um, um, factor that um, the uh, scene mode and the auto modes always use is a wide focus area. It will look through the entire area of your viewfinder or LCD monitor, uh, try and work out where the subject is and then focus on that. Now wide prefers um, or the wide AF area prefers um, subjects that are relatively close to the center and also close to the camera and it uses an algorithm of those two factors and it is very reliable because most of the time what we're photographing is towards the center of the frame and is the closest subject to the camera okay so but those three settings that I've just talked about they cannot be adjusted in auto and the scene modes so this is one of the reasons we may choose to leave um, these automated um, uh, settings so let's look at some of the um, limitations to auto and scene Okay, another factor that um, cannot be adjusted in the auto and scene modes is something called exposure compensation. Now we looked at the multi-metering mode and I did say that it gets it right most of the time, but there are certain instances where the camera assumes everything should be average, but there are some subjects that are just not average, such as a white swan or a black swan is not an average tone. It is either very bright or very dark. And so what the camera does is it will always uh, record a black swan as a grey swan and a white swan as a grey swan. And so um, uh, somebody who uh, is aware of this can go into uh, the uh, exposure compensations and adjust the exposure to refine this. A typical case where you might want to do this is if you're on a skiing holiday and there's a lot of snow around and you don't want the snow to be underexposed, grey, and so you would increase the exposure to render the white snow white. Okay, and the typical example of this is uh, again, um, maybe a lot of white walls in your scene. The camera thinks it's too bright, so we'll underexpose slightly, and we can correct this. Now you'll find um, uh, exposure compensation settings uh, on the A7 cameras, you'll find a dedicated dial on the top of the camera to adjust exposure. And remember when we're using these um, uh, mirrorless cameras, what you see is what you get. So if the, if the view looks too dark, we can actually just make it brighter so it looks correct in the viewfinder and that will um, be captured uh, in our final image. Now if you're working with one of the A6000 series cameras, which includes the 6300, 6500, you'll, you'll find the exposure compensation by um, pressing the bottom of the control wheel on the back of the camera, and this will allow you to refine the exposure. But this can only be done when we leave the auto or scene modes. Let's take a look at uh, one of those scene settings uh, such as macro. Now in uh, macro photography or the scene setting for macro, the camera is going to make choices. Uh, the first three choices are about the exposure triangle such as shutter speed, aperture and ISO. That will ensure we have an appropriately exposed image. We also have uh, factors such as drive mode, focus mode, focus area and metering mode all taken care of. Remember some of those settings are locked in such such as the metering mode and the focus area. But it chooses a single shot uh, autofocus, so that presumes your subject that you're shooting for macro is still. And also drive mode, it assumes that you want to take a single picture uh, for each press of the shutter release in macro mode. Now that's uh, mostly appropriate for most instances, I have to agree. But one of the things that the macro uh, scene setting cannot do is uh, change lenses for you. 
Now, um, in uh, when we, we buy an interchangeable lens camera, um, one of the great advantages is we can change lenses for specific purposes. And one of the reasons we do really want to change lenses um, in macro photography is to allow us to move the camera very, very close to our subject. Uh, most lenses have a minimum focusing distance, and the minimum focusing distance for a macro lens is designed to be very, very close. And this allows us to enlarge the very small subject in the viewfinder. Now a very affordable lens for the A6000 series is the this SEL 30mm macro lens and this will allow you to fill the frame with very small subjects. Now. Um, if you're working with a full frame camera, such as one of the A7 cameras, then there are two macro lenses that are designed for the full frame users. There's the 90mm macro lens, which is perhaps one of the sharpest lenses ever made um, by anyone. And there's also the more affordable 50mm macro f2.8. So take a look at those if you're really wanting to get into macro photography. Now, if you're just wanting to play a little bit uh, with macro before investing in another lens for your interchangeable lens camera, is there are a, a few uh, low-cost options. And these are basically um, uh, putting filters in front of an existing lens that will allow you to move closer. It's a bit like putting reading glasses uh, when we're trying to get closer to small print in the newspaper. There is also something that we can attach behind the lens, which is in a macro extension tube. Now, you can find these on eBay typically less than $30, um, but they're not going to give you the optimum performance that a macro lens would do. But it'll certainly give you an idea of whether you enjoy the genre of macro before investing further. Now this was uh, captured with um, an, a 90mm macro lens on a full frame camera and uh, one of the things that I've chosen to do is just show you I occasionally alter um, those settings that I would find in this scene auto mode. Now my um, adjustment is to move from autofocus into manual focus. Now one of the reasons that I do this is um, macro uh, lenses aren't known for being fast focusing lenses and they can also make an error of where they choose to focus. If we're taking a look at this insect for instance, uh, one of its wings is coming close to the lens and what um, the wide focus area often likes to do is photograph on the subject matter that is closest to that lens. And because the depth of field or the area of focus in a macro image is very thin or small, we actually want to move the focus to a specific part of this insect which is typically the eyes. Okay, so one of the things that I will often do is switch over from autofocus to manual focus. Now I don't have to leave, uh, leave scene mode in order to do this. The other reason that I find the manual focus is very easy is I'll just um, uh, pre-focus at a set distance and then I'll just move closer to the insect until the insect appears sharp and then take the image. I don't have to allow the autofocus to move backwards and forwards looking for the right point. I just move myself in relation to the insect. Now in order to move from auto to manual focus while still in scene mode is often just pressing the FN key on the back of the camera. This will give you the um, some of the menu options without going into the full menus. And you'll see on the top row there, there is focus mode highlighted. Just move the cursor using the, uh, the wheel uh, basically uh, um, to move to the focus mode area on the function menu, uh, press the center button to enter the options and choose manual focus. Okay, now this will allow you to um, experiment with that technique that I've just outlined where you move yourself closer to the subject until the subject appears sharp in the viewfinder. Now, just remember that if you do uh, make this option, the camera won't automatically switch back to autofocus when you've finished with this technique. You have to remember to go back to manual, uh, sorry, back to autofocus uh, when you're putting the camera away back in your camera bag um, to ensure that autofocus is still switched on when you next use the camera.
Another alternative um, uh, for shooting macro is perhaps just to use a telephoto lens. This uh, basically zooms in to your subject. Now they do have a minimum focusing distance which is much further away uh, than a macro lens but because they magnify the image you may be able to get the, the magnification of your subject matter that you require. Now the two uh, popular choices um, um, that I would recommend for um, A6000 series users is either um, the uh, SEL 55-210. This is often bundled as a two lens kit when people buy an A6000 camera. And this is um, actually a very sharp, very light, very small and very affordable lens if you don't already own it. If um, uh, you're looking at perhaps doing action sports as well, then you may want to look at this white lens on the left. It's actually designed for the full frame cameras. Um, it's a 70 to 200 f4. But uh, one of the advantages that this white lens has over this very affordable black lens is it can adjust its focus very rapidly when we're doing sports photography, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now this was um, uh, captured with actually the 55 to 10 lens, uh, the aff affordable black one that we just looked at there. Now sometimes you can't go as close as you like, um, but remember when we are shooting with our cameras we have lots of megapixels, so we can crop in tighter in post-production. Remember, um, we're working perhaps with a 24 megapixel camera and you only need 8.3 megapixels uh, to fill your 4K TV or an ultra high resolution monitor. So we can basically throw away two thirds of our pixels and still have a very sharp image to display uh, on our high resolution displays. And so this image uh, is an example of an image that hasn't been cropped. I've actually simply just got very close with the 70 to 200 mil lens, the white lens that we were looking at earlier. And this is a no crop shot at 80 millimeters. And you can see how close I can go to wildlife if the wildlife will let me. And this was um, shot with an 85 mil prime lens and again getting very close to the subject. Now notice how the depth of field is also very shallow. The depth of field refers to the area of sharp focus. It does get very narrow when we go very close to our subject. The same with macro as well is we do lose um, the area of focus. This can create um, a very nice effect but you have to be aware that, that focus is quite critical when we're working very close to our subjects. This is another example that hasn't been cropped. Again shooting with that 7200 lens at the closest focusing distance. Now this red squirrel in Great Britain is sort of aware that there might be something in front of him but I'm actually working absent, absolutely quietly. I've even set the camera to um, silent shooting uh, so that the, the camera noise doesn't uh, uh, frighten the animal away. And we're basically working at just one meter or three feet away from this squirrel and you can see I can fill the entire frame at this distance with this lens. And this was uh, captured with uh, another one of the um, telephoto lenses that's been designed for the full frame cameras. This is the FE 100-400 lens. Now this has got a closest focusing distance of one and a half meters, uh, which is, uh, uh, there's a little bit of an error on the screen, that's about four and a half feet away from the subject. But this is a very tiny tree frog, um, something that we could um, basically put in the palm of our hand and close our fingers without squashing or squishing the frog. So we can basically fill the frame uh, using a lens such as this without uh, resorting to macro. And in some instances it's actually easier to photograph small wildlife using these telephoto lenses rather than a macro lens. And uh, if we point uh, one of these lenses at something much larger such as this rhino, uh, we can basically just take a very small amount of detail from this animal uh, to fill the frame. And uh, this again has not been cropped in post-production. So this image, uh, again, uh, we've looked at some of those more expensive lenses, but coming back to that very affordable 55 to 10, um, it's a very sharp lens, and this is an uncropped image of just some detail that I've captured of an animal in the rain um, uh, at a zoo. And you can see how close we can go and get such a, um, uh, a sort of a portrait uh, of an animal in this manner.
Talking about portraits, let's move into one of the other scene modes um, uh, that uh, we can um, uh, dial in when we're in the scene mode settings. Now, this is an example of, uh, of an image where I might actually want to leave scene mode. One of the things that I love about um, a close portraiture, that close headshot, is using very, very shallow depth of field. And you can see in this image how shallow that depth of field is. If we see the eyes are pin sharp, you can see the eyebrows, which are a little bit further forward than the eyes, are actually out of focus. Now let's take a look at um, some of the scene settings the camera would choose for you. Now again, it chooses that one one sixtieth of a second. That's the uh, duration of the shutter that is open. That will typically freeze somebody who is trying to be still in front of the camera to have their photograph taken. So that's really quite appropriate. The aperture that scene mode chooses is f4. Um, and that's um, to uh, allow for the fact that um, when you buy a kit lens for a camera such as the a6000, f4 might be the maximum aperture. That's as wide as you can go. The aperture is like the iris in our eye. It opens and closes depending on the brightness of the day that we're viewing. And the wider that aperture goes, um, the shallower the depth of field. That, now what that does is it makes the backgrounds um, very blurred, which gives us that three-dimensional pop. It also removes dis um, distracting information in that background. So we can focus very carefully on the subject itself and nothing else gets in the way. Now again, it chooses uh, single shooting. It assumes that we just want to take uh, one shot, not multiple shots of our subject. Again, it um, will lock onto the subject and take one shot. So it's really designed for subjects that are still not perhaps walking towards you. And again, it chooses that wide focus area. Now, what it will also do is, is it'll switch the face priority on. So it will de auto detect a, a face in the, in the um, area of view and focus on that and on the latest model cameras it will also switch or enable IAF it will actually find the eye in the face when working with very shallow depth of field and focus on the eye not the ear not the front of the nose but just the eye and that helps that um, the, the images that we're capturing with a wide aperture are critically sharp Okay, so just like with macro, there are lenses designed um, for people who want to specialize in those uh, portrait or the portrait genre. And so I'll just uh, highlight those lenses for you. Now, the one on the left is the SEL 50 f 1.8. Now that f1.8 refers to the aperture. Now this is the great thing. This is not a zoom lens, so it's only a fixed uh, focal length lens, sometimes referred to as a prime lens. But the aperture is actually very, very wide. And this allows us to get that three dimensional pop. It allows us to push the background much further out of focus compared to using a kit lens. The equivalent lens for a full frame user, maybe using an A7 camera, is the 85mm f1.8. And again, that gives us that very shallow depth of field. Uh, the reason there's a difference of uh, focal lengths between these two lenses is because uh, of the implications of uh, focal length on sensor size. And I won't go into that into this movie yet, but we will often use a different focal length to get the same visual outcome, um, depending on whether we're using a crop sensor or a full frame sensor. Now let's take a, a look at um, the settings that um, portrait mode scene would do, but how I would modify them. Now in order to uh, choose that f1.8 aperture, which those lenses allow me to dial in, okay, I have to leave scene mode. Scene mode uh, will not allow me to adjust the aperture wider than f4 in scene mode. So this is the reason to go into aperture priority. I'm prioritizing the app, the wide aperture, the f1.8 aperture. And that's the only thing that I have to do when I put on my um, um, uh, prime uh, lens with the 1.8 aperture. I just need to move from the scene mode or auto mode into A on the shoot mode dial on the top of the camera. And then I'll adjust uh, the wheel so I can dial in the f1.8 aperture.
Another thing that I will typically do um, if the subject is moving is I will change the, um, the focus mode from single into continuous. This allows me to follow a subject um, uh, and the eyes of the subject even if the subject is walking towards me. Now uh, I will have to um, program a button on the camera for IAF. I need to hold that button down in order to um, keep IAF working in continuous autofocus mode and you'll find separate movies on how to do that on your camera if that is something that you want to do. If your subject is still then just proceed with the single shooting mode and you'll be okay. Okay so um, uh, IAF as I've discussed um, uh, works um, when the depth of field is very shallow. This is again using those wide apertures on those prime lenses. Look how out of focus that background has gone and how the figure um, sits uh, well in front of that blurry background uh, giving us that um, figure ground separation that is so attractive in professional photography. Okay, and the IAF will always give you confirmation that it has found the eye by putting a little green square. If you're in single shooting mode, it'll just appear momentarily. If you're in continuous shooting mode uh, or continuous focus uh, mode, then that will basically stay with the subject uh, for the duration of you half pressing the shutter release. Okay, and it allows you to uh, pick the eye out of, um, of the scene very, very quickly in just a split second. And uh, in the very latest um, cameras, it will actually find the eye even if the subject is in profile view, which is uh, remarkable. And we're talking the very latest cameras now, such as the A7 III and the A7R III and the A9 cameras. Um, the IEF continues to improve with each uh, um, um, release of the cameras. One of the surprising things on the very latest cameras, it will often uh, find the eye even behind sunglasses or in this case uh, the dark goggles of this swimmer. And one of the reasons, as I said, I like to use IAF in continuous autofocus mode is I could actually track the eye of this cowboy riding towards me across the um, uh, uh, a rodeo, rodeo arena. And so this is a very reliable way of always ensuring that my images of people are sharp. To give you an example of um, what that prime lens would do for you, and that SEL50 for 1.8 for the, um, the A6000 series users, that is again another very affordable lens and a very, very sharp lens for those guys. Okay, so this is an, a comparison between using the kit lens where you can see all of the distracting information um, behind uh, this figure here. And when we're using the prime lens, the f1.8 lens, you can see how much more that blurs out of focus to give us that um, more sophisticated looking portrait. Now one of the other things that again uh, scene mode or for portraits can't do for you is choose appropriate lighting. It can't move the subject into the best light. This is something that you actually have to do if you are looking towards um, skilling up in the area of portrait photography. Now I always like soft light when working with portraits. The sort of light that comes through windows or maybe on a slightly cloudy day, um, this is giving you this beautiful directional but soft light. This is the light coming through an open doorway or a window um, light and generally it's not direct sunlight coming through the window it's just the light uh, from the skylight coming through that window giving you that nice shape uh, to the face but also some good character. Uh, when you do this uh, well, when you're using those windows or the soft light, you can get some beautiful results that um, would have some people questioning as to whether you've um, uh, photographed your subject in a studio. Uh, it's such a sophisticated light and you don't need to use uh, flash uh, to get these type of images. Okay, so and again an example of soft diffused light on a cloudy day. We don't get any harsh shadows on the face and it's very, very flattering for the sitter. Okay, one of the things that I would also encourage you to do is uh, often, especially people coming from mobile phones, is the vertical composition of a portrait. Now, um, um, often it's referred to as a, as a portrait a composition or a, a format. 
uh, when we have this vertical um, view of um, a character. But uh, one of the uh, things that I would encourage you to do is if, if this is the way you primarily shoot your portraits is just to move the camera over into horizontal um, uh, shape so that we're not rotating the camera. And this horizontal framing allows us to get more of that beautiful out of focus background in the shot. And this creates some very interesting compositions, gives you a little bit more freedom. If I go back uh, just on one slide, you can see the area around these um, people it's very very small or non-existent and so we we can't enjoy that very soft focus if we can't see much of it okay so this is gives you an example always look for clean simple backgrounds when you're framing your subject as well and you might need to move yourself or move the subject slightly in order to get that very clean uncluttered background now, when you're approaching people, you, you do have to get quite close to people. Uh, I wouldn't use a wide angle. I would use that 50 mil or 85 mil because it does get you a little bit closer to the subject. But if you're photographing subjects like this, I would always move closer still. I would get that really close portrait. And uh, you'll see in my style of portrait, I, I would also, also um, crop in to the top of the head. Uh, I like those very tight um, crops. You'll see this when you're watching your Hollywood movies. Uh, when you're looking for the expression or emotion of a character, um, the cameraman will always go very, very close, um, this close, in order to show us the emotion of the, of the actor um, at work. So a typical thing when you're framing um, head and shoulder shots this close, try and keep the eyes above the center of the frame. Okay, and what this will do is it will also allow you to keep the chin um, off the lower edge of the frame. You do want to keep a little bit of breathing space for the chin, even if it means cropping into the top of the head. Another thing that um, you can factor in when shooting these uh, close portraits is um, if you're working outside and you can see the horizon line, the horizon line is a very powerful design feature in the framing of a portrait. And uh, we can actually basically position uh, that horizon line just by um, uh, adjusting our own vantage point to our model. So if we just uh, bend our knees slightly, the horizon line will lower with us. And I think it's a very powerful compositional tool if we can just lower that horizon line. So rather than coming through the head or neck of our subject, it goes through the shoulders instead. This will give us a little bit more um, negative um, uh, um, shape inside of the exposure for that out of focus blur and will allow us to get that better composition. One of my favorite techniques when doing this portrait work is to um, use the open door um, technique. It's a, it's a technique that is always a, a fallback position for me if I'm looking to get that powerful portrait. I'll position somebody um, to get that soft light. Typically uh, above most doorways you'll get a porch or a veranda which stops the light coming down from above. It sort of forces the soft daylight to come in from a lower vantage point and uh, we don't get the dark wells uh, in the eyes. Um, we get um, nicely illuminated eyes because that light is coming in from the side. Uh, we also get the very dark background because the light doesn't tend to travel into the interior with any sort of power at all. And so the interior will always look very dark and it gives us that studio quality uh, portrait just simply by using natural light and an open door. And you can always come side on to that as well. See how dark that interior is. But I'm using the light coming in from the open doorway now from the side to model that face. And again, this is soft daylight, not sunlight that I'm using here. And this is uh, just um, uh, at a suburban home with the front door open. And we're looking back down the corridor of the house. Um, but that is exceptionally dark, giving us this studio quality lighting simply by using this open door technique. Now, one of the things where the, um, the scene mode for portrait may not be appropriate as well, it also assumes that you're taking a portrait of one person or maybe two people with their heads very close together. So we don't need a lot of depth of field. If I'm using one of those portrait lens with a 1.8 aperture, 
I will stop down. Okay, this is where the F4 aperture of the scene mode portrait would be more appropriate. The depth of field, the area of focus um, is extended, which ensures that both people are in focus, not just one. Okay, and if you have one person standing behind another or even slightly behind the other, you really need to start stopping down quite a lot. And so this would be another reason to leave the portrait scene mode, go into aperture priority, and instead of opening up to f1.8 or 2.8, you stop down to f5.6 or f8. So get all characters sharp in the scene. So let's take a look at um, one of, uh, another scene mode called landscape. This is a very popular genre for people who buy these interchangeable lens camera. It's a passion for many amateur photographers and also a career for many professional photographers. Now, um, typically um, when um, uh, when we're shooting landscapes, we tend to um, try and get as much as the landscape in as possible. So we get a wide field of view. If we're using a zoom lens, we zoom out. We use the shorter focal lengths that might be 16 mil on a 1650 uh, kit lens. And uh, we also try and get more of the subject sharp right from uh, where we're standing right through to the horizon line. So we're extending the depth of field now the way uh, the camera uh, um, does this is to uh, and the way scene mode chooses to do this is to use a small aperture okay so we're closing or stopping the aperture down and this increases the zone of focus or depth of field now the settings the scene mode landscape will shoot is um, a shutter speed out of a 60th of a second uh, which is usually appropriate given the subject is not moving it's just to avoid camera shake and it's stopping the aperture down to f9 um, the problem uh, that i have with the scene mode for landscape is it it leaves the iso in auto now if we're working in the middle of the day this is appropriate because it'll choose a very low iso Often the optimum ISO on the most of the cameras we're using is 100. This gives the least amount of noise, gives us the highest quality image possible. It also gives us the biggest dynamic range, the biggest range of tones we can get in an image from very bright highlights to dark shadows without losing any information in either of those. Now, uh, I would for most of my landscape work come out of scene mode for one thing only and that is to move the auto ISO into a set ISO setting. Now I will actually choose 100 ISO. Now I will keep an eye on what the shutter speed is doing. If it starts falling below 1 60th of a second then there is a risk of camera shake. But for most landscape photographers um, a tripod is a, one of the things that you're going to purchase. Now the tripod doesn't have to be big. Um, you can actually get things called tabletop tripods which are very affordable. They're very small so you can put them in a jacket pocket or in a messenger bag. And uh, actually my favorite vantage point for landscapes is actually very low to the ground which is just as well because the legs of these tripods don't extend or don't extend very much. Now, um, when I'm doing uh, this, uh, often uh, in very low ambient light, or when I'm using um, uh, a neutral density filter, which is like putting sunglasses in front of your lens, it will extend the shutter speed until it's um, very long. Um, in this instance, you might find the shutter speed goes into many seconds, not a fraction of a second, but many seconds. But the camera will keep, uh, sorry, the tripod will keep the camera stable. Now, what I will always, uh, what I will also do, is uh, switch the drive mode from single into self timer, so that when I press the shutter release, there'll be delay of two, five, or ten seconds before the camera takes the shot. And the reason for this self timer is so that uh, me touching the camera, the vibration that I set up by uh, triggering the shutter release, um, basically calms down before the camera then takes the shot. And just as with portraiture, just as with macro, there are lenses that are designed specifically for landscape photography. 
Now, when we're shooting um, a landscape on a kit lens, um, uh, the widest um, uh, uh, focal length might be 24 mil for a full frame user or 16 mil for a crop sensor user. Now, this gets a certain amount of the scene in, but doesn't en encapsulate or capture everything that we're viewing. It just uh, captures sort of a postcard view of the scene that we're viewing. And uh, typically you can, um, if you want more of that scene, you invest in an ultra wide angle lens. Okay, something that will use a focal length that's shorter than that 16 mil for the crop sensor users. Now for full frame users, um, the, the ultra wide angle is on the left here. It's a 1635. It comes in two flavors. You've got an F4, more affordable version, and there's also a 2.8. Now, um, for the crop sensor users, there's the excellent SEL 1018. And the 1018 means that it starts at 10 millimeters. Now, the 10 millimeters doesn't sound that different from 16, but it gets an awful lot more in to your image than the 16 mil focal length. Okay, to give you an example of these ultra wide angle fields of view, um, we've got I've got a couple of examples here. I've also got a couple of examples of if you are using one of the the later model cameras with steady shot inside, you can typically go below 60th of a second when hand holding the camera. Um, the, the steady shot inside the cameras can allow you to go quite slow before you have to put the camera on a tripod. And I can reliably shoot with maybe a 15th of a second, or in this instance, and sometimes you have to be a, a little bit lucky when you're going this slow, a fifth of a second. It helps if you don't drink a lot of coffee. It also helps if you um, uh, put your legs apart slightly to give a, a sort of a broader stance. Also, if you can rest your elbows on something or lean against a lamppost you, or a tree, you will get a steadier um, camera hold and so you're much more likely to be able to capture a sharp images using these sh uh, slow shutter speeds without using a tripod. And again, you can often find yourself working at the first light of day or the last light of day with an ultra wide angle lens without using a tripod. Now, if um, if the shutter speed does extend, as in this instance, this is a 1.3 second exposure, you will need that tripod. And this image that you're looking at now is was actually captured using one of those table top tripods that you see um, pictured there. Now, um, the drive mode, um, again, if you want to alter the drive mode, just press the FN key, the function key on the back of the camera. You'll see the drive mode in the top left the upper row of those function settings, um, select um, the drive mode, and this will allow you to go and select, uh, instead of single shooting, you can also uh, move down a couple and select that self timer. You may also find the drive mode listed uh, here. You can see the self timer symbol just by pressing the left side of this control wheel here will allow you to adjust the drive mode here without going into that FN menu. So one of the things that you might also do as well as investing in a, a tripod and an ultra wide angle lens and one of the things that um, is very popular for landscape photographers is to invest in an ND filter for your ultra wide angle lens. Now you can buy variable NDs or fixed NDs and obviously the darker you go, um, the longer the exposure will be, which is fine um, if you've got a tripod. Uh, but what it will do is it'll smooth out water to give you that uh, tranquil water look to help the viewer focus their attention on the subject that's not the water. Uh, time of day is another thing that the scene mode can't do for you. Um, uh, just simply dialing in the landscape scene mode isn't going to change the time of the day. And the time of the day that is most popular for most uh, landscape work that you might admire online is at the first uh, part of the day, sometimes before the sun has risen, and then shortly after the sun has risen, and again at the other end of the day, 
don't only photograph the sunset but go beyond the sunset here we've got the last light of day the sun has set um, more than 20 minutes ago but we're still seeing um, uh, the last light in the sky and we're also seeing the city light up and again, this is a same example. The sun has only just set now, but we can see the distant city lights lighting up. Okay, so uh, try and work with those ends of the day, if you can, um, to explore those rich colors. And, um, uh, and uh, it's certainly a nice time of the day to be out uh, working with your camera. Now, one of the things that you may notice if you're shooting in the raw file format is when you're shooting um, this uh, type of high contrast scene where the sky is still bright, even though the sun might have set, the foreground will often be very, very dark. Now, um, if you're working with in JPEG, the dynamic range optimizer will lighten the shadows in camera. If you're shooting in the raw file format, however, you'll need to raise the, um, um, the shadow values in post-production in a program such as Lightroom. And this will allow you to convert a high contrast scene that we just uh, saw before. This is the same shot, just with the shadows moved uh, much brighter, the highlights coming down a little. I also do what's called a graduated filter in post-production. This is just to, again, allow the sky to go a little bit darker to balance the two exposures between sky and foreground. You can buy graduated filters in front uh, to put in front of your lens, but um, if you've got a post-production software such as Lightroom, you can do that in post-production. And I have uh, YouTube movies that show you how to do that in less than a minute. To give you an example, um, this, is, um, this is a correctly exposed image. Uh, I typically will um, uh, check the exposure on the back of the camera after taking the first shot, and I don't want the brightest highlights in the sky to overexpose. And I will let the shadows, the foreground shadows, go uh, quite dark in order to protect the highlight values. But then in post-production, I can simply do this is I can balance the exposures. Now I do have a movie on my Alpha Creative Skills YouTube channel that shows you how to optimize this very scene in less than one minute. Okay, so if you want to break the rules, not all landscape work is um, shot at um, an, with an ultra-wide angle lens. Uh, you can use your telephoto zooms to shoot landscape as well. But I've just uh, outlined basically what where most uh, um, uh, photographers work, what lens they work with, and what uh, aperture values they work with when shooting in the landscape genre. Okay, the fourth scene that I want to look at is action. And it's one of the scene modes in the camera that pretty much nails all of the correct settings for 95% of what you would actually want to do in action photography. Now, what um, the scene mode for action prioritizes is not aperture for depth of field. It prioritizes the shutter speed, how long um, the shutter is open for. And the shutter is a little bit like the curtains in your home. How long do you open those curtains to let how much light in before shutting off the light or closing the curtains? This is the duration of exposure. Now, in landscape, we were looking at um, uh, shutter speeds of a 60th of a second in scene mode, and I showed myself going even slower than that. And 60th of a second is probably enough to avoid camera shake, getting blurry images because the camera is moving in your hand, but it's not enough to freeze something that's moving quickly. Given this example, the building is pin sharp, but the cyclist who is moving through the scene is blurry. And that is simply because the shutter speed isn't short enough to freeze that fast moving subject. So what we do with fast moving subjects is decrease the duration of the shutter speed so we can freeze action. And that might be a bird flapping its wings or a cyclist going past the camera. And uh, 
typically um, something a shutter speed that would freeze the uh, so even the most fastest moving action in sports would be something like one two thousandth of a second and this is the exposure that I've used for this shot and you'll see that it's frozen this um, kite surfer who's just lost his board and is attempting to walk on water and that freezes that perfectly every little uh, water droplet is sharp uh, and in, including the expression on this poor guy's face who is basically just about to be dunked in the water the other thing that um, uh, most uh, action uh, photographers, whether it be wildlife or sports, uh, choose to do is rather than taking a single shot of the action, is to take many shots and then simply choose the best shot in post-production. And so we use something called continuous shooting. This um, basically uh, takes multiple shots so long as we keep the shutter release pressed down. Okay, and so generally what you'll do is basically something like this, is you'll take a burst of action and then in post-production you'll basically look for the shot that had the best um, dynamic action and that's the one we choose. So um, you'll see that uh, it's a great fun to basically shoot these bursts of action, have the camera focus on the subject, even though the subject is changing its distance from the camera, and uh, basically then choose the best shot in post-production. And again, um, the camera uh, with the right scene, if you just choose the auto uh, scene setting for action, um, generally uh, you'll get shots like this. You'll basically have the camera track the focus, take multiple shots, uh, and it's a very reliable auto setting. Now, um, I generally um, would very rarely adjust these settings. One of the settings that you can adjust even in the action scene is something that I'll highlight now. Okay, so we can look at those um, those defaults that scene mode is choosing, that one two thousandth of a second. It's choosing a very wide aperture to compensate for that short duration. It's a shallow depth of field, but typically when we're working with sports, that is an appropriate setting. And it'll allow the auto ISO to go very high in order to capture um, and be able to utilize those very short um, shutter speeds. Now, on the very latest Sony Alpha cameras, we do have an advantage over some of the earlier models. And that advantage comes in the fact that the later model Alpha cameras uses more focus points. Now, the very latest cameras now use hundreds and hundreds of focus points in order to ensure that the camera can track where the subject is in the frame. An example of this is if we take a look at this image of this eagle in flight. Now um, the eagle uh, or the head of the eagle is quite close to the edge of the frame in this instance. So all of the area in the center of the frame is simply just background. Now in older style cameras and pretty much all DSLRs, the focus area, the focus points are all clustered around the center of that frame. Now fortunately, um, if you've got an A6000, we've got a much broader spread. And on the very latest cameras, such as the A7 III and the A9, the coverage basically covers the entire sensor with those 693 AF points. In this instance, however, you see if you've got an older style alpha camera, if with that center cluster of AF areas, such as maybe an A99 or A77, you will find that um, you have to try and keep that cluster of AF area uh, AF points over your subject as the subject moves in order to ensure that the camera can carry on focusing on the subject. Uh, with uh, the latest models, you can see that um, the focus uh, can actually start uh, quite close to the edge of the frame and then basically just uh, adapt itself uh, and move the focus area as the subject moves within the viewfinder. And so without moving the camera, the, basically the, the, uh, the autofocus, the continuous autofocus will track the subject as it moves and changes its place in the viewfinder.
Now for the uh, sports um, or action shooters and maybe if you're going on an African safari you are going to want to invest in one of these telephoto lenses. Now we looked at the 55 to 10 um, which is often bundled as a kit, a two lens kit with a, and a camera such as the A6000. But if, um, if the subject is moving rapidly I would encourage you maybe to look at uh, this lens either for a full frame user or for a crop sensor. This is the 7200 f4. There is a GM, a, a G Master version of this, which is the 2.8. Um, it's twice as heavy, twice as big, probably twice as expensive. Uh, and there's also a 100 400 version. But certainly the 7200 is a very sharp lens and will keep up with very fast action. So uh, when used in an instance like this, um, even if you can't uh, get close like with say a 100, 400 telephoto, remember we can still crop in post-production. Remember if, if you are cropping, just keep an eye on the pixel resolution. There are 3,840 pixels uh, on the longest dimension of a 4K screen. Doesn't matter how big your TV, whether it's a 70 inch TV, there's still gonna be three 3840 pixels on the long dimension and so long as we don't crop too aggressively we're going to have a very sharp image to display on those screens and that is the resulting crop from that image we might have cropped in a long way but we've still got more than enough pixels uh, to give us that uh, super quality image and you can see the camera tracking beautifully as this dog charges towards me through the shallow water one of the settings that um, uh, you can change in scene mode is uh, outlined in this movie that I created at a Rodeo. And this um, is basically in continuous autofocus. Um, but what I've done is I've changed the focus area and I'll discuss this after showing the movie. Um, one of the reasons that um, I wanted to show that movie is um, wide, as we've discussed um, at the beginning of this movie tutorial, favors front and center to find its subject. Now in that movie of 22 images that I captured at that rodeo, even when the cowboy's ha uh, horse moved in between the cowboy uh, and the camera, it didn't start focusing on the horse. And that is because I moved the setting from wide to lock on AF wide. And this uh, will be an option when you're in the continuous focus mode is to choose the lock on options. Now we can see that there is a little arrow either side and that is because if you press left or right you're going to get a number of lock on options which replicate all of the other AF areas but in lock on mode. And what lock on tries to do is stick with your subject even if it no longer is front and center as we're shooting the images. It must be typically front and center when we start, but it doesn't have to always be front and center as the action unfolds. And so that is a lock on option. Now, if you're an A6000 user, you will find that there is a center lock on feature, but all of the other subsequent uh, cameras in the range, it's simply a matter of choosing the it in the AF area options. Okay, so shutter priority as we've looked um, is, um, and the scene mode for action is, um, is very reliable at capturing this. Uh, scene mode in this instance would have done exactly the same as any other custom settings that I would have dialed into the camera manually. Okay, so um, lock on is an option that you may want to choose. Otherwise, just, um, just go to scene mode, 
choose your action because those are very reliable settings for 95% of the instances where the subject does stay front and center through the duration. And it doesn't need, these uh, latest model alpha cameras don't need a lot of time to lock on. This speeding um, uh, scooter uh, driver in, in Bali was locked on in just a fraction of a second. And then as we do the burst of shoot, uh, shots at uh, eight or 11 frames per second, uh, the camera shifts focus as the subject gets closer to the camera and uh, you can see how reliable these alpha cameras are I locked on to this cyclist uh, when he was still way in the distance and it's going to be sharp all the way to the minimum focusing distance of the lens that I'm working with so let's take a look at the summary of the things that we've covered. Okay, so we've looked at if you're in auto, first of all, I would probably encourage you to start looking at the scene mode settings and telling the camera what it is you're shooting, whether it's portrait or macro or landscape or action and look at some of the other scene mode settings as well. Now for action, um, the only setting that you may want to adjust in the scene mode is to go from wide into lock on AF wide. And that is for instances where you're tracking maybe um, a particular a player on a football field and that player might momentarily go behind another player that will always try, if possible, to stay with your primary subject. Uh, when we were in portrait mode, uh, the initial portrait scene settings are very good if you've got a kit lens, but if you do invest in one of those prime lenses with a 1.8 aperture, come out of scene mode, go into aperture priority and select the wider aperture, whether it be 2.8 or 1.8 to give you that very shallow depth of field. In single shooting mode, um, the, the latest model cameras will look for the eye as well. In continuous shooting modes, you will have to program a button on your camera for IAF. In landscape scene setting, most of the settings are again appropriate. It's giving you an appropriate aperture for that depth of field. It's slowing the shutter speed down and um, to a 60th of a second because your subject is not moving and that's uh, using a, as low as ISO as possible. But scene landscape mode doesn't know about tripods. And so if you are going to use a tripod, I would come out of the uh, scene setting go into aperture priority again, select um, an aperture like um, F11, and then uh, put the camera on the tripod and dial in a manual low ISO. And maybe switch the drive mode to a timer delay so that when you press the shutter release, any vibration from your finger will die out before the camera takes its shot for maximum sharpness. And macro, um, generally the scene settings are all correct except uh, the one piece of advice that I can give you for macro is I find it personally easier to switch from autofocus to manual focus. And um, I would also encourage you to either uh, look at using a telephoto lens to enlarge the size of the subject or by a macro lens that allows you to get much closer to your subject. So that uh, concludes this uh, tutorial to help users uh, move beyond the basics. Now, if you did want to catch up with me, um, maybe over a longer duration, either go to my website, markgaylor.com, or maybe you'd like to work with me uh, on a photo tour where I can guide you over an extended period of time. Okay, I'll be working uh, on two photo tours in United States in September in 2019. Um, take a look at the World Photo Adventures site. I'll be working alongside a photographer called Darren Leal. Uh, so you'll have two photographers uh, working and guiding you. And um, this will be primarily towards um, uh, landscape, although there will be some cultural opportunities as well on these photo tours. So um, we're going to some great places, um, Yosemite, uh, Death Valley, and uh, we're also doing a, a, another tour immediately following the first tour where we're looking at the desert, deserts and canyons uh, moving into Utah. Okay, so if you'd like to join up with me, check out uh, World Photo Adventures for 2019, September, USA. Okay, so I'm Mark Gale, uh, Sony Global Imaging Ambassador. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Just a thumbs up if you found this useful and also put any comments down below the movie and I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks.